Thank you. Thank you for having us here this morning. Uh, I'm Ann Watts. I'm running for County Commissioner District 3 and uh, I'm looking forward to working with the people and for the people in this position. I am a former school administrator uh, for the Baker County School District and uh, with 30 years of public administration I have worked on many projects that have impacted this community and I hope to continue that for you and uh, for the processes that uh, keep our county viable. Uh, so if you want to know more about me, you can also visit my website at wattsforbaker.com. Uh, good morning and thank you all Joel and Jessica for having us here at the press. Uh, it's a great way for everybody to get out and hear our ideas and everything all in one spot. So I appreciate that. Uh, like we mentioned, my name is Tyler Mobley. I'm running for County Commissioner District 3. I was born and raised in Baker County. Lived here my whole life, and uh, my family has a long lineage here in Baker County. Uh, my parents are Wesley and Tina Mobley. They had the sport and goods store here, Sport Shack. So I pretty much know about what size shoe everybody wears here in the county. So uh, going back, you know, I just got a long history here in Baker County, and I have a two-year-old at home. I got one on the way, a little baby boy. He's gonna be due opening day of hunting season. So uh, good planning there. But uh, what, what's the county going to look like in 20 years? And that, that's some of the stuff I'm looking at. And how are we, how can I help be of a change to it or be of a help to keep the county the way it is? Um, see a lot of things coming and just looking to help in any way I can. Uh, just for everybody watching, the answers are two minutes each. Uh, one minute rebuttals if needed. And so for this first one, um, this one's for you, Mr. Mobley and kind of we'll, we'll start you out easy <laughs> what are your top priorities in the first half of your term if elected the first half of the term if elected mm -hmm. okay some of the top priorities i think facing baker county right now would be growth and what's coming in the in the next few years and trying to get ahead of it and get a, a plan established on how to help facilitate and maintain healthy growth and I would say health is a, a regular slow growth, not just a quick growth where we're outrunning our infrastructure and, and things of that nature. Uh, number two would probably be helping work directly with the sheriff and the BCCDC board and helping keep them, you know, long-term fiscal stability to the Baker County Jail and that, that situation there. So uh, those would be my first top two things along with keeping the vision study for the, uh, the fire and rescue and seeing where we can go along in that direction. But that, that would be the first two or first three things that I would look at in the first half of the term if elected. Uh, so I would um, certainly um, share in some of those things that he, that he shared with you because those are always going to be top priorities. We have to have public safety. Uh, we have to have enough deputies, we have to have fire and rescue, uh, and we know growth is upon us. So those are certainly always going to be ongoing priorities for any county commissioner. So I would say perhaps uh, what we might strengthen some of those things is taking a needs assessment approach at those things. In other words, you know, what is our five-year plan? What does that look like? Who does that include? Who are the stakeholders? What are the resources that we need to make that five-year plan? Is it legislative appropriations? Is it higher than our state level uh, assistance? Do we need to go to congressional uh, uh, help for some of those things? You know, what are our resources? Looking at those processes to make sure that they are viable processes, and if not, then uh, where need is changes, then we have to approach those things. But I'd say maybe advocating for a needs assessment approach in how we operate going forward so that um, things are sustainable for a long term. Regarding county fire protection, if another safer grant application is approved by FEMA to hire eight additional firefighters to cover underserved areas of the county, would you vote to accept the federal funding even though it's temporary and would need to be replaced with county revenue after five years to keep staffing levels up? 
So again, I uh, will repeat, we have to have fire and rescue services. Uh, you know, obviously we have depended on volunteer services for many decades. And I'm very thankful for all of those volunteers who have uh, served us and served us well. Uh, but, uh, but as growth comes, uh, you, you have to have paid services. That's what, uh, that's what the people in this community uh, depend on. My house, his house, your house, whoever's house. When that happens, we want fire and rescue to be available to us. So sustainability, again, uh, there has to be a needs assessment approach. There has to be a way to sustain things. And uh, to me, those things are priority in our county. So uh, would we seek outside resources to continue those things? Absolutely. Grants, have you? Um, as in, in the school district, I, you know, my role, one of my roles uh, was grant writing, competitive grant writing. Those things are scored and ranked and not everyone leaves with a, uh, an award. Uh, however, one of the things that we did was always monitor those things. So you look down the road to see, okay, this is coming to an end. What other resources are out there that we can continue it without going into our reserves, without using our current budgets? And so those things allowed us to do a whole lot with just a little. And so that is an approach, that is an ap approach we can uh, continue. But if it comes down to where there are no resources outside of us, uh, and those things have dried up because of the economy uh, downturn or what have you, well then again, services are required. We have to do what we have to do. And uh, again, I still think planning in advance and have some sustainability plan in place is important for those needed services. Public safety, uh, law enforcement, fire services, uh, whatever those things are, roads, uh, and so, Again, there has to be planning in place, and it has to be informed and intentional planning. So there, there was a vision plan, a vision study done, and uh, I, I would want to look at the vision study again and get a little bit more in depth on it and where we're at currently with what was in place. And I, I don't think it was a, adopted by the board. I think it was approved or vice versa. It was looked at by the board. Um, and see where we're at regarding, you know, our vision of where we, we thought we were. Um, possibly look at maybe doing an updated vision study just mm -hmm. to see, you know, because I know we've, we've accepted some of the safer grants here mm -hmm. today. So we're kind of fast forwarded a little bit through the, where we were in the vision. Um, to get directly to it, I would have to look at where we think we would be, like I said, kind of with the vision study mm -hmm. and, and taking on those eight additional employees and what impact it would have to the county. Now, the safer grants are great because it does buy you some time in order to plan for those things, and I think that we definitely need more here in the county. As more residents come and more businesses come, we need to be able to support those. Fire and rescue and emergency, if you call 911, we need to be able to respond immediately. Um, that's kind of the, the short version of it. Like I said, there, there's a lot of variables in that. If I had to vote on it right now today, I would say yes, so that we could start planning for two years down the road, or what do you say, five years, I think? Mm -hmm. Five years down the road, whenever you take on those eight additional employees. Uh, the zero status for the county, which mm -hmm. is when they every unit they have is basically out, and so exactly. they're having to call in for Columbia County, Duval, you know, the surrounding areas to help out. It's a frequent problem. What would you propose to reduce the number of zero status times for emergency medical services and how would you fund it? Whew, how would you fund it? That's the, that's the million dollar question, correct? All right, that's it. So uh, it would come back down uh, again to the vision study and looking at it and seeing where we're at. Would the safer grant that was just mentioned help in that and providing more additional employees? And with the additional employees, if we're getting paid for a certain period of time, could we allocate some funds to another rescue? Could we allocate some funds to another fire uh, engine? You know, and, and those those type of things. Could we look at that? Um, I would like to you know make sure that we are efficient and effective in all areas before doing that, first of all. 
Uh, second of all, I do like the cross training that has been done between the fire and the rescue so that, you know, if a, if a rescue has to go out, a fire truck can go assist and they're trained in both, both areas. I think that was a great idea. Um, the funding, we'd have to look at some of the safer grants and also the assessments and make sure that we're on top of the, the needs of today. I would, you know, venture to bring in an outside consultant possibly and see where, uh, where we lie in what it's, what it's costing us and also what monies we're generating in order to support it. So. Okay. Okay, so uh, those things are based on interagency agreements that we have with other counties. Uh, one, we can expand that to other counties around us that are willing to do that and willing to join into that. Uh, certainly, in you know, expanding our circle of influence in that area brings other resources to us. Um, uh, so again, I think the our leadership in fire and rescue management has done a good job of trying to pull the information and the data together to present that plan uh, to our board. Uh, you know, workshopping things like that is helpful in knowing where the holes are and where the weaknesses are and where we can fill in. Uh, so uh, long term, again, uh, it, we have to keep pulling in data. We have to keep looking at our resources. We have to keep looking at ways to be more efficient and more strategic. Uh, but as growth comes, we are going to have a need for more services, and that's a given. Uh, so looking at all the outside resources, looking at the resources we have, um, continuing on with, uh, with cross-training certainly is a, a key factor. Um, making opportunities available for people to get cross-trained at, at little cost to them because they're willing to do it, they're willing to serve. Uh, that's a key factor. Uh, but in terms of funding, uh, again, uh, you have to look at the resources you have, uh, what's sustainable. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I've found to be successful in my own career is what I call uh, graded funding. So, uh, meaning if you understand all the budgets and you understand what they're available for and how they can be used, then you may be able to piece together things that we already have that could help sustain some of that in addition to outside resources. So, uh, we call it braided funding and uh, that's another way you can do things that um, can be a long-term, have a long-term impact. Again, it's really about looking down the road what you have now, and if you know it's coming to an end, we have to start reaching out for other resources. And uh, and I do think there are other resources out there Time's that pay for things uh, uh, that we already take out of our budget. This one is, we're kind of starting to focus on the budget now. Um, would you support the return of impact fees on new construction new or higher property assessments across the board or another option to fund the budget shortfalls for the county departments like fire rescue roads and or solid waste to name a few why or why not okay so i know at one point in time our county had the impact fees and then of course that was tabled uh, out of 67 counties, we are one of 24 counties who do not currently have an impact fee other than the school funding because that's in state law that that cannot be waived. And so, uh, you know, looking at growth, and first I want to clarify that a county cannot operate alone on just impact fees. It can uh, lower the cost of things, it can help pay for things uh, and help us stay out of our reserves. Uh, which is an important thing to do for a community to be uh, viable and have a, a, an operating budget going forward. Uh, but, uh, so, but we are seeing hotels come up. We are seeing, you know, hearing that Wawa is coming. Uh, we, are, uh, we have Greystone development in process of changing hands and, and coming to fruition. Uh, there are other uh, developments that are out, you know, coming up on the, to the LPA board for review. All of those things impact our services here, our fire and rescue, our public safety, uh, all, all sorts of things, road, infrastructure. Uh, so 
I do believe that impact fees have to be looked at. It has to be considered, but we should put things in place that determine how those things are, how that impact fee is assessed in terms of corporate, uh, in terms of family uh, lands that uh, where people want to give their their child a piece of their property that already has uh, been assessed in terms of fire and rescue and things like that. Uh, and we have to decide who is a developer. Is it one house? Is it 10 houses? Is it a development? Uh, but people, are, but companies are coming in and taking advantage of the fact that we don't have impact fees. And mm -hmm. for that, you, we will bear the burden of that as taxpayers. Right. right. Yes, ma'am. So the impact fees, like Ms. Watt said, were, were taken away, I believe, 2008 was whenever they were tabled back in 2008. And that's whenever the, the recession hit and everybody knows about that time. Um, in my opinion, impact fees are a great way to help govern and control the growth that comes. It's a, it's a great way to raise funds without raising taxes on the, the citizens that are here currently. Uh, it, it's, it's one of the, the catch-22s because if you put it in, then it's going to slow everything down for sure. And if you don't, then, then we're still wide open for everybody coming. Uh, I think, I think they, they need to pay to come. Um, what that is, what that looks like, I believe it was like twelve thousand dollars back in two thousand eight was the impact fee. I would want a before I could vote yes or no on it. I would want a an outside consultant possibly, or you know in house to look at it and see exactly what we need to charge for the impact fee. I don't want it just well, let's just pull it out of thin air and just say hey twelve thousand is what we need to charge. I want the study shown for the the, the roads for the, the garbage, per, or garbage assessment, fire and rescue, all of that type of activities uh, to give us a clear, definite, you know, here's how much we should be charging in order for those uh, items. Right. Um, I would really like for it to be earmarked directly to those and not just go to a general fund because if it goes to a general fund, then we're gonna find somewhere better to spend the money, I'm mm -hmm. sure. So that, that's one of the stipulations I would have with that. Um, raising property taxes, I, I don't want to. I would like to look and make sure that we're doing everything possible to not do that. You know, and, and that's really being efficient in all areas before we venture to that. We, we're in a, in a great position as a, as a governmental entity that we control both sides of the ledger. So how can we, you know, be efficient as best we possibly can? Right. What are the most important attributes to look for in new volunteers for the county commission appointed advisory boards, such as land planning agency, the tourism development council, um, the that long BCCMC, <laughs> Baker County Corrections Management Corporation's board of directors, and how much value would you give to their recommendations? So basically, you know, what we're looking for, it's kind of a two-part question. Okay. What's the important attributes when looking for volunteers for these boards, and how much value would you give to the board's recommendations to the commission? Okay. So one of the, the things that I would look for is I would like a good mix between private and government on the board. I, I like, you know, the, the private side, the people that are very business-minded, very, you know, money-savvy on, on that side. I'm not saying the government side isn't. I'm saying I would like a very good mix on the board that, that way. Just to see, you know, the vision of what's to come and what, you know, what's happened in the past and what's to come to to come up with a, a good game plan, right? Now, in order to the the second part of your question, I believe, was uh, how much how much thought or how much value do you put value, in the recommendations right. from those volunteer based boards mm -hmm. to the commission? Okay. So the, that right there, there is a, a staff level review right now that happens at the county commissioner meetings mm -hmm. between the county manager and her staff and then the LPA board. Miss Ann, I know you're on the LPA board. They, they bring a recommendation to the commissioners. And I, I would definitely, you know, I mean, the, the value that you look there, I mean, they're doing their job, you know, mm -hmm. and that, that's what they're there for is to curtail, you know, the, the outside problems before that gets to the commissioners. And they go through a very good process and I think they're one of them do a great job. So I, there's, there's a lot of value that I would put there. 
Uh, so having served on the LPA board for 15 months, uh, I do think a broad representation of uh, the county is important uh, in what our demographics are. And uh, uh, sharing in uh, his thoughts about you know, a balance in a knowledge base, you know, whether it be governmental uh, experience, uh, business experience is important. And um, uh, so I also think attributes in terms of being able to communicate well with the public, uh, understanding, digging in and understanding those processes, whether it be on the LPA board or the BCCMC board or animal control, uh, but being willing to put the time in to do those things so that it is an effective board. Uh, being willing to do extra training if the staff uh, makes that available to you. Uh, those things make those boards stronger. And then, of course, understanding the processes of county commissioner roles and how uh, decisions can be appealed or uh, how the county commission board may make a different decision than the LPA board or the BCCMC board. So uh, just understanding really the lay of the land and how all of those processes work, that's important too. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, th those things are in statute, most of those appointed boards. And once you're a voting member, say on the L LPA board, you're considered an officer of sorts. And so, um, it's important to take a look at that. I think there is an application process in place. We do make recommendations to the county manager in terms of that, uh, but really the staff review lies with the county manager in terms of who they put forward to the, to the commissioners for appointment. Okay. So. How should the county attract and hire employees while still being good stewards of taxpayer dollars used to pay competitive salaries and FRS pension benefits. Okay. Well, uh, there's two two perspectives to that. You can uh, keep wages low, and uh, you you hire you go through your applications, uh, and, you know, in a methodical way, and you choose the best candidate, and so you keep wages low in terms of uh, salaries and HR costs. Uh, or you can have fewer employees and have higher wage offerings and you attract much more uh, maybe um, experienced kind of uh, employees, which also sort of spans out into the, the quality of services that we have for citizens. So there's two aspects to that. Uh, now, uh, you know, those positions, those salaries serve they serve families that are here. And so you ha we have to find a balance in between, uh, you know, do we want the greatest skills? Do we want a balance of skill versus helping our community families in terms of them having uh, salaries, jobs, uh, local jobs, and then that money stays in our local economy because we know that when people work in Jacksonville, most of those funds, uh, you know, their salary is spent in Jacksonville because they're on their way home. You know, they have to take care of things before they get home. So, uh, so you know, there's two perspectives to that. And so weighing out the greater good for the community would be my approach. One of the first things I would do is make sure we're efficient in all areas and just try to make sure we're making the most bang for our buck mm -hmm. with all the, all the departments. Um, second would be, you know, in my opinion, I think I'm just going to use hypothetical numbers. You can pay one guy sixty-five thousand versus two guys at forty, and get the same output. Possibly, you know, it, it just depends on on the department and and each position specifically. But look at that and see exactly, you know, if, if we paid one guy a little bit more, could we get more production out of it? Um, where would we fund it? Well, that that would be the the million dollar question again. So that's going to be looking through our budget and making sure that we're efficient and effective in every single area before we even venture to, to raise the other side. Um, just making sure that we're, like I said, making the most bang for our buck mm -hmm. and, and getting down there and seeing what we can do with it. The county jail is mm -hmm. on pace to lose about a million dollars this year. So given that jail reserves are expected to be two to three million next year, arguably near the minimum required by the bonds. What should the county commission do to help balance the annual jail budget? 
Okay. So currently, I believe we're paying about 2.8 each year to house our inmates. Um, one of the things to help balance the budget, I believe it's, it's being um, brought to the board right now of a 3% raise each year in order to help to help fund that. Now, I know everything costs more nowadays. I mean, you can't go buy the same thing today that it cost, you know, two years ago. So I know everything's a little bit more expensive. However, we want to be efficient again in, in doing that. The, uh, how could we work together? I mean, I know we're already working together, but how can we, as a, the commissioners, work better with the BCCMC board and the sheriff in order to maximize, you know, the, the fiscal stability over the next couple of years is super important. That's going to be a, a question that is going to have to be sought by, by both parties and make sure that we're on track just to save the taxpayers dollars. Okay, so lots of moving parts associated with that. You have the BCCMC grant with the USDA uh, in place and uh, you also have uh, ICE requirements uh, for the detainees and under federal law they have a lot more permissions and um, things that are required for them that you know elevate costs that the local inmates do not require and so uh, lots of moving parts to be considered but when we look at deficits down the road you know uh, the math is there that eventually uh, the that bleeding uh, uh, has to stop and uh, for things to maintain as they are now I, I want to say that um, that if you consider ICE detainees, now at some point in time, you know, back long ago, uh, that the administration at that time thought that, felt that, you know, being in the ICE detainee business was a way to generate more revenue for this county, and it has, and it did, and it provided jobs. Uh, but things shift with every presidency change, a policy changes, uh, what they do with detainees changes, and really, ICE detainees are a federal responsibility. And so I think we have to, before we look at our reserves in the county, before we look at taxpayers to support that solely, uh, we have to reach up to the federal level to help us because the detainees are ultimately their responsibility. And as a nation, we have already paid IRS taxes and payroll taxes, and those things are supposed to be supporting the detainees. So I would say we, we have to look toward our congressional leaders and get them to help us. Again, when presidents change, policy changes, uh, we can press in that area as well uh, before we hit our own local reserves. Okay. How would you improve county parks and recreation in terms of facilities, programs, and or services? I believe parks and recreation is important to the health of a community. Uh, I believe that children and families in every community, every area, uh, needs access to parks and recreation of some sort. And I think our county has done a good job considering uh, the budgets that we have in place for that. Uh, fire and rescue, Public safety, that's always going to be the heightened priority in terms of budgets. Uh, and uh, But there there has to be, a again, a plan. What, what is our plan for parks and recreation over a five-year period? And that's very helpful because it keeps us on track rather than uh, us uh, approaching things as needed, on an as-needed basis. We have to have those things in place. Uh, so how would, I, how would I improve them? I'd look at areas that don't have them first of all, to make sure that we have equal access across the community with recreation parks. Uh, and I would uh, build, try to build community through our resources so that, uh, you know, even the communities that don't currently have them have equal access to what we currently have, right? So uh, it's all about processes and resources and getting people uh, who are the stakeholders involved and with input on improving. So I think it's more than just the county commissioners. I think we need community input on those things. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I believe we've done a, a decent job so far of that. You know, I, the ballparks are getting renovated right now. I believe here in the, the NAB Sports Complex, mm -hmm. there, uh, there's a lot of local uh, developers, a lot, a lot of local business owners that are helping in doing that. 
and they're, they're more than willing to do it at any given time. I think that uh, one of the things that we could look at, first of all, is uh, I'm, I'm always touch on it, getting efficient in every single area, making sure that we're not wasting any money on frivolous spending or anything anywhere, just so that we can put the most money that we can towards each particular item on, on our budget. Uh, in doing that, you create a little bit at the end, right? And so what, what's, what's at the end or what's in the middle, you can put towards park and recreation a little bit more than what we have been. Um, just making sure we're super efficient in that. Second, if we're doing that, I know that there is a lot of people in the community that would love to help. Mm -hmm. And so it's also working with the community, you know, and, and a lot of them just want to be asked, like, hey, is there, is there anything we can do? You know, if, if I put up 50%, can y'all help, you know, cover the rest of it? And there, there's more than there's more than enough here in Baker County that would be willing to do that. Not saying that for every single aspect of it, but for different little ventures that the county would like to do, I believe that is something that we could look at and say, hey, is there anybody that's willing to help us? You know, right. the county routinely waives or exempts. So when I say the county, I mean the county commission specifically routinely waives or exempts residential developers from trad traditional road paving requirements to encourage the construction of new residential subdivisions. Should the county continue with this policy despite so many complaints from residents regarding the poor road conditions? Mm -hmm. So one of the, the items that I, one of the items, one of my job duties right now is a, I'm a project manager right now for a local construction company. One of, one of the things we do is build roads. And so I, I, I take this question super to heart, you know, because I believe that a developer, if they come in, should be paving the road and maintaining that road until it's given over and signed off by the county. Some of the things I want to look at is what is our, what is our specs on new development and the roads that are being brought in. If you go to any other county around, not saying Baker County doesn't, I'm saying they have a handbook, you know, here's the specs that we have. Here's what you're going to do if you come into our county. I, that's one of the things I want to dive into and make sure as a county we're super efficient and super dialed in on that so that when a developer comes in, here's what you're going to do for us. Here's what we require and we're not going to wave from it. Um, and, and if you look across the county, that may be more of a, uh, you'd have to look at it logistically. You know, if, we, if it's a, a development way out, then maybe it is a little bit different. But anything that's super close, I believe that we need to have a, a good plan in place for paved roads so that it's not a, a burden on the county later down the road. Because if you do it right the first time, it should last for quite a while, and then the county won't have to step in and fix potholes and, and such. But going back, going further into that question, the county needs to be able to help you know, pave those, or not pave them, but help, you know, uh, help fix and maintain those roads down the road. So that's something that the county needs to look at too, on what's our long-term goal in helping keep those roads up to date and up to standard. So we discussed earlier impact fees, and we just are now discussing the fact that we are, uh, have in the past allowed for lower quality uh, road development in, in, residential development areas. So uh, in my opinion, we are giving both things away to developers, uh, outside developers, who are coming in, uh, buying the lands, and they are developing the lands, they are taking their profit, and they are leaving. And so those, the quality of the road is uh, left really as a burden on on the people later and of course through the county commission processes so uh, you know impact fees for developers uh, quality roads for developers they're here to make a profit uh, so I think in years past when we needed some more development uh, and we were trying to attract development uh, that was an okay thing, perhaps, before, you know, uh, the, the people came. Uh, but now that development is here. And again, if you look at our LPA, uh, upcoming LPA meeting, there's more on the, more on the board coming. So I think uh, we have to get that in ordinance. We have to get those things uh, laid out either through workshopping it and say that, no, we won't accept this lower than this. It has to happen. 
uh, again, it's about uh, being efficient in our processes now so we can improve our sustainability later and keep it off the taxpayers' backs and to keep the burden out of our community. What kind of residential development pattern is more appropriate for the unincorporated areas of the county? More rooftops with smaller lots or fewer rooftops with larger lots? In keeping the, the ruralness of our community, now we have lots of lands out in the forests that are protected at the federal level that can't be developed, so we will have those as long as we uh, make sure we're listening at the federal level and the policies that change and those things that remain in place. Uh, but in terms of incorporated areas, again, it goes back to infrastructure. What is our current infrastructure? What can it sustain? Do we have a sustainability plan going forward? I think there's a lot of variables that have to be looked at before we can really answer that specific question. Fire and rescue, where are those things located? Where are the firehouses located? Uh, you know, what is our public safety uh, services? What does it look like in terms of if it's smaller lots with more houses or larger lots with fewer houses? So again, uh, that needs assessment approach, that five-year plan looking down the road and all, and which would always be changing. That plan always changes, depends on economic factors and other things, tax base, revenues, those sorts of things that are always having to be considered by a county commissioner. But uh, so I know that doesn't answer your question, but I think there are too many variables to consider to say, hey, it's going to be this way or that way. Uh, and that takes uh, working together with other county commissioners to come up with that plan. Okay. So I, I believe that we keep a rule charm. You know, Baker County is known for our, for our you know, fewer rooftops, bigger lots. And that's, that's a lot of what's happened outside of the incorporated part of Baker County. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. I think there should be a mixed baggage sometimes. And, and it's, it's going to be case by case. I mean, it, you're going to have to look and we're going to have to work with the LPA board, the staffing, and, and see what is around it. You know, does it fit in that particular area? You know, before we make a decision one way or another, we gotta we got to just weigh out all the options. I would like to try to keep fewer rooftops, more houses, but in some areas, it's not going to make sense. You know what I mean? So that, that's just one of the things. It's a case-by-case -case scenario that we'll have to look at and see. Who have been your political role models and why? Who have been my political role yeah, models what, Who inspired you to get into politics? <laughs> Donald J. Trump. How about that? <laughs> if, if you look at, uh, I'll, I'll say you a little history real quick. My grandfather was head of the Democratic Party way back in the day. However, the, the Democratic Party from back in the day and the current Republicans are two. Yeah, it, it, it all changed back in about 2009, 2010, when there was a big shift in our county. Um, but one, one guy I spoke to the other day, he said, man, your grandpa would be proud of you right now. Just for, just for trying, you know, and that's the thing. You just got to get out here and try and see what we can do. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, you, if you look at it, uh, I know it's, it's, it's a crazy topic, but Trump mm -hmm. himself, I mean, was he always into politics? I mean, he was always a savvy businessman, but he jumped into it because the county is a business at the end of the day. And how can we efficiently run the business to make the most sense for you, me, for everybody here in the county, and get the best output, you know, for it? So right. one of the things that uh, I like to come back to is, is one of the things, hey, run it like a business and let's go with it. Okay, so uh, my willingness to serve in this capacity and uh, join up with the county commission role really has nothing to do with uh, a pol political figure. In fact, uh, while I have my own conservative views about things, uh, I, I think unity really would be the, the word that I would use rather than a figure, political figure. I certainly admire uh, Mr. Trump for all that he has done and, uh, and he certainly made a change when he came in. Uh, so, really, it's more for me about working to solve problems uh, and working with others to solve problems, collaborating with the community and collaborating with the other stakeholders to uh, sort of have a vision for our county, what that looks like, uh, how we will pay for those things, what are the resources available, who are the people involved, uh, are the processes uh, efficient? If they're not, then 
uh, let's take a look at that. If uh, ordinances or laws need to be changed, well, let's follow the processes and the law of the land to get that done. Again, about betterment for our community, about betterment for the people in our community. So my, my pursuit of this really has nothing to do with politics at all. So. Why else should voters fill in the circle next to your name on the ballot? Hmm. Well, again, I, uh, I have some unique gifts and talents, uh, grant writing skills, and which certainly brings in other resources. Uh, county commissioners don't typically write grants, uh, but I have honed those skills and that's something that I can help the county with. I can also help other organizations with that. Uh, but uh, I have 30 years of public administration experience uh, with the school district. So school district is government, county commissioner role is government. Uh, lots of those things bleed over into one another. Uh, uh, keeping up with local, state, and federal budgets has been my career path, and so all those things have different requirements. Again, talking about braided funding, what can you use with all those different funds, and uh, how can it be spread out into different areas so that you maximize those things. Uh, and uh, just being able to work with the community to solve problems, having community input. Uh, that's um, something that I'm interested in doing more of so that people have that voice and they understand processes better. I do think that people need help uh, understanding information, having access to all the information up front. That certainly makes our processes within the county departments a little more streamlined, a little more efficient long term. Uh, and so uh, those are some things that I would take a look at. Again, working with other people to get things taken care of in advance before they happen with a proactive approach. All right, and Tyler, we'll let you wrap us up. So uh, why else, after everything we've talked about, should voters fill in the circle next to your name on the ballot? Yes, ma'am. Like I, like I started with, I was born and raised here. I love Baker County with all my heart, and I, I plan on staying here. Like I said, I got two young children growing up in it, and I want the best for Baker County. Whether, whether, whoever it is, I want the best, you know, and that, that's some of the things that I'm, you know, ready for. And uh, one of the things that I, I feel like sets me apart would be I have an accounting degree and a finance degree, and I, I understand both sides of the ledger on the budgets and everything else. And a lot of it comes down to the money in the county. You know, how can we get the most out of what we got without having to raise taxpayer dollars? That's some of the stuff I want to look at. Um, you know, born and raised, got a family here. Uh, I'm willing to sit down with anybody and everybody. My phone rings all day, it seems like nowadays. But I'm ready to, to help facilitate change and help facilitate, you know, keeping our rural charm here in Baker County. Uh, looking at it, I'm just excited over the next 20 years of what potential this county could be at and uh, going with it from there. So I'm excited and looking forward to it. Well, I thank both of you for joining us.